Good morning. Good to see you. Um, welcome to Monroe Missionary Baptist Church. It's good to see each and every uh, single one of you here as we gather together to uh, worship our God and encourage each other. Um, I hope you're doing well and thank you for uh, traveling safely through the snow and uh, arriving here uh, this morning. Uh, before we go into the uh, worship of God together, uh, we want to, we have a few announcements to uh, mention. Uh, first of all, I want to say that today is the last day for Operation Christmas Child. So if you have boxes uh, during the song time, if you want, um, when we do offering during the first song, you can come up and place them up here at the uh, steps of the stage. Um, today, the they will be here gathering boxes from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. So if you have them, you bring them a little later. Today at 1 to 3, they're going to be here, I think, on the north side of the building. And also tomorrow, 8 to 10 in the morning, they will be here uh, gathering and receiving those boxes. So those are the times, and tomorrow is the last day to do that. If you have boxes, please bring them uh, by tomorrow from 8 to 10. Uh, we have offering time, as usual, uh, during the first song, um, so you can come up and bring your offerings. And, and lastly, uh, before we go to worship, we want to extend our sympathies to uh, Ken and Diane Garn and their family. Ken and Diane this week lost their firstborn son in a car wreck, um, and his visitation is today from 12.30 to 4.30 at, is it Pollack Funeral Home in Temperance? So 12.30 to 4.30, um, he passed away this past week, uh, Ken and Diane Garn. So please pray for them, that God would strengthen them and their family. Um, their son had a wife and a child. So please pray for them, that God would be near them and strengthen them and uh, comfort them uh, at this time. Okay, let's go to worship um, in God together. And we open up uh, from the scriptures, uh, Revelation chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, seated, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth, and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might, forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Amen. As we go to God in prayer this morning, this worship service that's going on in heaven, we're going to ask that we would be able to participate in that this morning in a small way to taste heaven together. 
Let's pray and ask him to be with us and in our midst. Our great God and Father in heaven, you speak and you shake the whole earth. Your voice thunders. It's powerful. And the amazing thing, Heavenly Father, is that your voice, which is so powerful and striking and thunderous, is the voice that comforts us. It's the voice that's told us that though we are sinners, though we have failed to honor you as we should, though we are uh, people living in a world that's full of sorrow and uncertainty and tragedy, that you, our Heavenly Father, are restoring this world in Jesus Christ, your Son. We know that he is worthy to take the scroll, and he has taken it. And he rules and he reigns over this world. And we thank you that the times are in your hand, that nothing happens by accident, and that at the end, for your people, all things work together for good. We do pray, Heavenly Father, this morning, our hearts are heavy for the family of Ken and Diane Garn uh, as they've lost their son, and he leaves behind a, a son and, and a wife. We pray for the family, that you would comfort each and every one of them, that they would know your presence, that you are near to the brokenhearted, that you raise up those who are bowed down, that you are compassionate and kind. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be glorified in this time, even in the midst of tragedy. We thank you uh, that you have brought us safely through the week, and we weren't able to be together last week, but we thank you for being, regathering us and assembling us together this morning. And we pray that as we sing praise to your name, you would direct our eyes to you, that you would remove our minds from distraction from the things of this past week, and that all things will be done to your praise and your honor and your glory for this morning. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing a song about who our God is. of a thousand burning suns blazing in the heavens there is only one he is our God who commands the nations building up and tearing down silencing his rivals there is only one he is our God God, holy, you alone are holy, matchless in your glory, holy God. come to save us when we turned away his love conquer us with kindness there is only one he is our God he is our God holy you
the king on the throne who was and is to come and to the lamb who was slain be glory now to the king on the throne who was and is to come and to the lamb who was slain be glory now to the king on the throne who was and is to come and to the lamb who was slain be glory holy you alone are holy matchless in your glory no one is like you We have a time of, of a confession and scripture reading. Um, one of the things we do in my family's house is uh, we ask the question, who's a sinner here? And everyone raises their hands because it's important that we remind ourselves of who we are because... Um, one of the things about sinners is that we believe our own press and we think that we're better than we actually are. And one of the things the gospel tells us is that we're worse than we think we are. But in a sense, don't take this wrong, but that's okay because Christ has died. And so whenever we come to the gospel, we don't make any more excuses. We just acknowledge who we are and we trust his grace is sufficient to cover our sins and it's sufficient to heal us. We read together from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Paul writes this, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, the gospel is not that you love Jesus, it's that Jesus is more interested in your salvation than you are. That's the gospel. The gospel is not that you have done something great for God. It's that Jesus did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing for you to save you. And we receive that love today. Let's acknowledge who we are, but receive his, thank, his grace this morning and praise him for his love. Will you pray with me? Our Lord Jesus Christ, we read in the gospel and in this letter that you loved us so much, that you who are equal with God the Father in power and glory and majesty and honor, you had all the prerogatives of God and yet you lowered yourself to us and came down into our world, the world that we have made a mess of, and you came because you did not seek your own interests, but the interests of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to do this. Lord Jesus, we think about how often we don't seek the interest of other people. We're quite selfish, honestly. Maybe we're selfish with our spouses. We're selfish at work. We can be selfish with our own children or with even our church. We're thankful, Lord Jesus, that there's not a selfish bone in your body, but that you love us perfectly and you willingly laid down your life and died for us and didn't just simply die, but died the death of the cross for us. 
We thank you so much for showing us great love and forgiveness that while we were weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins because who here can say that our hands and our minds and our hearts are clean? No one but Jesus can. We pray that you would forgive us and that you would pardon us. And we thank you that in Christ, our sins are removed from us as far as the east is from the west. We're told elsewhere that you have thrown our sins into the sea and there is no bringing them up again. We thank you for your love. We thank you that we are reconciled to you through the blood of your son. And we pray that you would bless our brother as he brings the word to us. For Christ's sake, amen. Amen. Once again, let's stand and sing a song of praise. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our King. Make known the power of His grace, the beauty of His peace. Remember how His mercy reached, and we cried out to Him. He lifted us to solid ground, to freedom from our sin. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell, oh, he's done, till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our Lord. His power in us is greater than, is greater than this world. To share the reason for our hope, to serve with love and grace. That all who see him shine through us might bring the Father praise. Oh, sing my soul and tell all oh, he's done till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus, our light. No other name on earth can save, can raise a soul to life. He opens up our eyes to see the harvest he has grown. We labor in his fields of grace as he leads sinners home. Oh, sing my soul and tell all oh, he's done till the earth and heavens are filled with his glory. Oh, sing my soul and tell glory you may be seated amen thank you very much matt for leading us in worship uh if you would uh just one more time i'd like to ask for you to join me in prayer uh before i bring god's word to you let's pray Father, I pray that if there is any change that happens in this room today, I pray that that change would be that as we sang that song just now, that our souls will sing until the earth and the heavens are filled with His glory, Lord. I pray that if there were any that were here now not able to sing that song before this message, Lord, that they would be able to sing it after. Lord, I pray that you would do a miraculous work in people's hearts today. 
not because of anything that I can do, Lord, but by way of reminder of your grace to them. Father, I pray that the only name that would be made great today, here and now, is yours. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, thanks for being here. I know that uh, the weather outside is a little frightful uh, right now, and uh, you know that's I'm not going to start out in a jingle. Don't worry. Um, but um, I know it's uh, not great weather outside. I know that last week was a little confusing. We had to cancel services because uh, some of our uh, pastoral staff families were exposed to some people that were sick. And you might notice, and I just want to give you a little piece right now. You might notice that uh, one of our pastoral staff's not here right now, Pastor Tim, but. Just in case you jump to conclusions too quickly, I want you to know he does not have the COVID. Um, it's, it's okay. And so, but he, he does have a disease that happens every time around this year. Uh, we call it deer standitis. And um, he's not here. And for some reason, doctors do tell us that the only way to get rid of it is to go out into the middle of the woods and observe hours and hours of silence and doing absolutely nothing. And so that's what he's doing right now. He is doing what the doctors have told him to do. And uh, so you can pray for him that he may not come back empty-handed. Um, but uh, no, uh, this, this was actually planned that I'd be here today uh, many weeks in advance. And uh, I'm very excited to be. It's been a while since I've had a chance to bring God's Word to you. And so I'm looking forward to that. But I'm very excited about the fact that I get to preach on what is considered to be the climax, I think, of the books of First and Second Samuel. The chapter that we're at today, Second Samuel chapter 7 is kind of the highlight, it is almost the peak of what you might say is being conveyed to us in these books, 1st and 2nd Samuel. Um, But I I do have the challenge of the fact that you haven't been given the context of what's happening here in chapter 7, because we weren't here last week. And there's no way I can give you a full context of what happened between now and then, Uh, but if you would like to, you you are able to go on our website, you're able to go on Facebook. We do record a video that's put out every Wednesday where we kind of review the sermon. And this past week, what we did was we went through what Pastor Tim would have preached on, so you can get a much more full picture of that if you'd like to to go back and listen to that. But just to give you a brief overview of of what happened, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, where we find ourselves is Saul the king is dead. And so finally David, the rightful king, is able to be made king over his people. But there's a problem, there's a hiccup. And that hiccup is this, is that Saul's army, the, pe- the leaders of his army, actually take Saul's son, one of Saul's sons, and make him king over Israel. And so what you end up with then is a civil war where you have the tribe of Judah loyal to King David, and you have the rest of Israel loyal to one of Saul's sons that is made king. And even though this is only the span of a couple of chapters at the beginning of 2 Samuel, it says that this kind of civil war actually happened over a period of seven years. This was a pretty intense, long, drawn-out time of civil war of God's people. And so you got to think, I mean, if you're in David's shoes, you're just like, man, finally, I'm king. Nope. Not yet. You got seven more years of civil war. Well, long story short, Saul's son is eventually killed, and David is finally made king over a united Israel. And so he's king. He's in Jerusalem. David has a palace that's built for himself. But in chapter 6, it really sets the stage for what we're going to see in chapter 7. You see, because in chapter 6, what happens is this magnificent event where not only are God's people united, not only are they experiencing a sense of peace, but also the Ark of the Covenant is finally brought into the capital. It's brought into Jerusalem. And And what you see in chapter 6 is a massive celebration of joy and gladness that not only is God's kingdom united again, not only is the rightful king on the throne, but also what you see is that God is with his people. He's in the capital as he should be. And so that's where we leave off at at the end of chapter 6. That's the context, the very basic context that you need to know. Like I said, if you want to know more, please go back, watch the video. We discuss a lot more in that. But that's what you need to know where we start off here in chapter 7. And so if you would look down at chapter 7 with me, I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 just for now. Because we see kind of in a a setting of events where we see God do some surprising things in chapter 7. But verse 1, it says this. 
Now when the king, who is at this point David, now when the king lived in his house and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. What you didn't see is that in the meantime, the beginning of 2 Samuel, David has actually had the time and the ability to build himself a pretty nice palace of costly stone and of cedar. This is a really nice house. But in chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant of God is, is brought into the city, but the dwelling place of the Ark of the Covenant is the same that it's been for hundreds of years. It's called the Tabernacle. It's a tent. It it is really a glorified tent that God gave his people the design that they are supposed to follow. And wherever they would go, the tent would be packed up, carried, and taken, and there he would reside. And so David, very possibly from his palace, able to look out onto the city and see the tabernacle set up in the distance, he says to himself, man, look at this house that I built. I'm, I'm living in a an amazing house. God is living in a musty old tent. There's something not right about that. I feel like I need to do something to change that. And so he goes to the prophet Nathan and he says, I want to change this. I want to do something about this. And Nathan says to himself, you know, I mean, David, I I think you're motivated by humility. I think that you want to do this out of a good heart. It seems like a good thing to do, to want to honor God and to not make yourself above him with a nicer dwelling than what he has. And so It seems right. Go, do it. So Nathan's encouragement to him. But then we see God start to turn the tables on David's intentions here. So let's keep going. Look at verse 4 with me. God says in verse 4, But the the same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I've been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? The beginning of what God has to say to David is this, is, David, look, I have been traveling with my people in this tent that I designed, by the way, content for all the years that they were wandering, for all the years that the judges were watching over my people, for all these years that that Saul has been king, for all these years I have been content to dwell with my people in this tent. Have I ever once asked to be built a temple? No. I've not asked once. And so God essentially here tells David, David, you know, maybe thanks for the, the, for the goodwill to do this, but I've never lived in a temple. I've never asked to live in a temple. I don't really want to live in a temple. You know, it's actually quite funny to think that the comparison between living in a musty old tent versus living in a temple is any better for God who resides in heaven as if it would be any more appropriate dwelling for the God of heaven and earth to reside in a temple versus a tent. Both are too low for him. And so God tells David, I don't want you to do this. But then God really starts to do some surprising things. That was surprising enough. But now we see something even more surprising. He continues. Look with me at verses 8 And I'm actually going to read through verse 17. What we see here is God makes something called a covenant with David. I'll talk a little bit more about a covenant in just a second. But look at verse 8. Track with me here. Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I took you from the pasture. From following the sheep that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly, 
from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you and shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of this kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God, in a very surprising, very unexpected way, comes to David. When David says, God, I want to build you a temple, God says, no, I don't want a temple from you. Instead, I'm going to do this for you. And God makes something called a covenant with David. Covenant is a word that is not very common in our everyday lives. We don't really use that word very much, and it's kind of churchy, and so maybe if, if you don't fully understand what it is, that's okay. I'll just want to try to give you a, a very simple understanding of it, but at various times throughout biblical history, God has kind of, uh, in a way, dictated his relationship with his people through covenants that he's made with them, and a covenant is akin to a contract. It's like a legal agreement where two parties come together, and they, uh, they agree on certain specific terms, and if you fulfill those terms, there are blessings, and if you uh, fail to fulfill those terms, there are curses that happen. Uh, think about if you own a home or you rent a house, like a mortgage. That's a covenant that you make with the mortgage company. The terms are, we will give you the money up front you pay it back over time. And the blessing of fulfilling your part of that covenant is you get to keep your house. The curse that comes from not fulfilling that covenant is you lose the house. That's a covenant. It's a contract that you make. Just in case there's any confusion, I said in chapter 6, what happens just before this is the Ark of the Covenant comes into Israel. Have you ever wondered, why is this called the Ark of the Covenant? It's called the Ark of the Covenant because it's, it's essentially a box. It is a box that contains the written covenant that God made with Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai. And he, God commanded, he said, build a box, put the covenant in there, and call it the Ark of the Covenant, and carry it with you whenever we go. And the Ark of the Covenant is what would reside in the Holy of Holies, and it represented the presence of God. It's, that's why it's called the Ark of the covenant. There are numerous covenants in the Old Testament that God makes. When we take the Lord's Supper together, we read a passage of Scripture often that says, this is the new covenant. It talks about a covenant language, right? There's a specific covenant in the Old Testament, though, that I want to point out that's very similar to what we see here in this covenant that God makes with David, and that is the covenant God made with the man Abraham. This is back in Genesis chapter 12, chapter 15, chapter 17. He makes a covenant with Abraham. And in case you're a little fuzzy on the details, let me remind you of what some of those stipulations were. Some of the things that God said he was going to do for Abraham in that covenant. He said that he was going to make Abraham a great name. He said that he was going to give Abraham many descendants. He said that there was a promised land for God's people to reside in. He said that he would curse their enemies. And last of all, he said that he would bless the nations through his line. That's the covenant God made with Abraham. There might be a little more. There might be uh, some more details. Obviously, there's this idea of covenant is a huge topic that you could honestly have a whole sermon series on itself. But we don't have that time But notice the similarities in the covenant God made with Abraham and the covenant God just made with David. In verse 9, he tells David, I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. In verse 10, he says, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. In verse 11, he says, I will give you rest from all your enemies. And in verse 16, he says, your house, in other words, your lineage, 
this line of kings that will come from you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. There's emphasis that's put on the line that's coming after David, the descendants of David. He says that this descendant of David will be the one to build God a house. The throne of this descendant, of this line of kings, will be established forever. That it even says of this this line of this person that's coming that he will be to God as a son and God will be to him a father. He even says that when this descendant commits iniquity, that God will discipline him, but that his love will not depart from him as it did Saul. What God is doing here with David is an, uh, is an amazing blessing. David, listen, David understands why the people of Israel are where they are right now. And he understands that the reason they are is because God is a covenant-keeping God. The reason that they are in Israel, the reason that they are where they are, the reason that they have a kingdom, that the kingdom is united, that the rightful king is on the throne, and that they are experiencing at this time peace from their enemies is because God, in effect, has kept his covenant that he made with Abraham. David understands that, and essentially what God does here in chapter 7 is God comes to David, even though David has no clue and he's not asked for it, God comes to him and says, David, I'm going to continue that covenant through you. This is going to continue through you. There's going to be continued blessing and peace and a place for my people, and it's going to happen through your line. That's what he says to David. And so David responds. We get to verse 18 and we keep going and and David responds and and he's taken aback. And there's, because if you notice, God didn't really give a reason for why he was going to do this through David. He just said that he was. But take a look at David's response to this reminder that God has given him. Verse 18. It says, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You've spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. You see, David identifies the two things that God has done and what he has said to him and what he's revealed to him. David identifies the fact that the reason I am where I am, what God has said about where David is now, the only reason that's happened is because God has brought him there. In, verses, uh, in the verses that we read before this, what did, what did we see that God did in verse 8 and 9? God reminds David first of the grace that he's already shown him by saying, I took you from among the sheep and I placed you as a king over Israel. And not only that, I have been with you. My presence and my protection has been with you wherever you have gone. And I've given you victory over your enemies. David, the reason you're here is because of my grace and my grace only. And then what else did God say he was going to do? David responds and says, and yet this was a small thing in your eyes. This is verse 19. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. This covenant that God makes with David He he tells him, David, this is going to happen after you You are dead. I'm going to continue doing this through you. This is coming in the future. This is what's going to happen. To where David says, you've spoken also for your servant's house for a great while to come. And what is David's response? Who am I? Who am I that you would do this for me? You see, what God did in this covenant is he very clearly reminded David of his grace. To where what we now see in David, and and honestly David's posture, and the way that he seems to be relating to God now through this conversation, when he comes to the Lord through prayer, his posture has changed. There's been something that has changed about David, and I think that it's helpful to summarize it in this way. That God's grace has turned David's guilt into gratitude. God's grace turns David's guilt into gratitude. And here's what I mean by that. What do I mean by David's guilt? How is David guilty here? 
At the beginning of chapter 7, when we read about David's desire to build a temple, look at the words that he says in verse 2. He says, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. There's at least somewhat a sense of, of guilt in David's desire to build a temple for God. There's this sense that something is not right here. I have this, but God does not have this, and that's not right. I need to do something. I need to build a temple to rectify the situation, to make this scenario right. That sounds like his motivation, though it might be driven by honest, genuine humility, wanting to do something great for God. It's also driven by this sense of guilt that he has. And what we've already seen, I've already explained, what God says to David in response to his desire to do this is simply this, to remind him of the grace that he's already shown David and also to tell him about the further grace he's going to continue to show David and his line in the future. God reminds him of his grace to where now we see what David is able to say starting in verse 20, magnifying God's grace. Look with me at verse 20. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord, because of your promise and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people, whom you redeem for yourself from Egypt, a nation and its gods. And you established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. This would be an interesting thing for you to do maybe this afternoon as you're home with the nasty weather outside. Read through chapter 7, and I want you to count the number of times God says that he will do something versus the number of times David says he will do something. And then I want you to count the number of times David ascribes God the credit for what has happened here versus what David should receive credit for in this chapter. Tally them up. And then count what the difference is between what God does and what David does. David sees that here. He's been reminded of God's grace. And so all he's able to do is to, be, is to come to God and say, God, who am I that, would, that you would do this for me? And he's able to say, you know, what more can David say to you? God, I don't know what else I can do to you. I don't know how else I can bless you for this amazing, astounding blessing that you are pouring out on me and on my house to where he finally says in verse 22 that therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you and there is no God beside you. All of a sudden, the idea that David needs to do something for God dissolves into a recognition that there is nothing that David can do for God except worship him for what God has done for him. David came to God thinking that he needed to do something for God. But God reminded him that actually David needed God to do something for him. It's easy for us, I think, to do the same thing in, in terms of trying to define our relationship with God by the things that we do for God. It's easy for us to do this, but this passage today is a reminder that our relationship with God is not actually defined by what we do for God. It's defined by what God has done for us. The way that you define your relationship with God will determine the posture with which you relate to God. Let me explain that. If you define your relationship with God based on the things that you do for God, you will forever approach God with a posture of guilt. A posture that says, God, I haven't done enough for you. God, I messed up. I know you're upset with me. I'm sorry. You'll constantly feel like you need to be doing more. You'll constantly feel like you need to do more good to outweigh your bad. You'll think that God's not happy with you because you haven't done enough. 
You'll say things to yourself like, I know that God would be happier with me if I changed this about myself. Maybe you start bringing your kids to church because you feel like you'd be a better parent and God would be more pleased with your parenting if this is how you do it. You'd be more involved in, in church activities because that's what would be good for a good Christian to do and God will be well pleased with you if you do that. Maybe you have a difficult time praying to God because honestly the idea of coming to God in prayer and coming before his throne, you feel too much shame to be able to do that because you know you messed up two weeks ago. Maybe you know you messed up two minutes ago. And so you can't even pray. That's a posture of guilt. That's a posture of feeling like you are not worthy. But if your relationship with God is defined by what he has done for you, you are then free to approach God with a posture of gratitude, as David does here. You'll find yourself saying things like, who am I to deserve this? And what more can I say to you, God? Just as David was left saying only that. Instead of being filled with guilt and burden and shame, you will be able to come into this place filled with awe and wonder and amazement at God and who God is and what God has done in your life. The fact that he would be so gracious and so kind and so loving towards one such as you. To, you would be brought to a point where you would have to say to yourself, I can't actually do anything but praise him. I can't actually do anything but sing of his glories, but shout back to him how amazing and awesome he is and what he has done. You'll be brought to a place where that is all that you can do. And now, guess what? The things that you do for God, they are not done out of, out of a sense of duty or need. They are done out of a profound sense of a desire to exalt God's name and make him famous among the rest of the world. It's a joy to do those things. That's what happens when you change the way you define your relationship with God. That's what happens when you change the way you define how you relate to God by what you do for him, and all of a sudden it turns into what God has done for you. So David's first response is to praise God with gratitude, to worship him, because that's all he can do. But he continues on. Look at verse 25 with me and see what David says next. In verse 25, he says, and now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you've spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, and do as you have spoken. If you were to read through the rest of the chapter to the end, that's essentially what David says over and over again. Is he asks God very humbly but very boldly, God, you've said you're going to do this, now do it. You've promised this blessing, I'm asking that you would do it. In a, in a real sense, what David does is he prays the Lord's Prayer. You might remember that part of the Lord's Prayer when it says, your kingdom come, your will be done. Part of your prayer life that you should have is simply praying God's promises back to him. Simply asking God to do all that he has already promised to do. And that is what David does. He asks God to do what he has already promised to do. And he does. If we were to keep going through 2 Samuel and even into 1 and 2 Kings, what we would see is that God has an immediate fulfillment of this covenant that he's made with David in his son Solomon. You might remember some of the details about Solomon's life. Solomon is the one to build God's temple. It's a glorious temple. It causes a lot of praise and a lot of gladness to happen in Israel. At the beginning of Solomon's reign, it is the most established that, that this kingdom of Israel will ever be on the earth. It is the, the period of the height of power in Israel. They have the most wealth, the most influence, the most renown in all the world in Solomon's reign. But it also comes about that as God promised in his covenant, that when Solomon sinned, and he left the Lord. God disciplined him, but his love did not depart from him 
The kingdom was not fully ripped away from Solomon, and so there was still a succession of kings over Judah. But that initial sin, that initial ripping away, it continued on through Israel's history. And basically from Solomon through the rest of the line of the kings, it just kind of got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And God's people never really repented to come fully back to him until it finally came to a point where God did fully discipline his whole people and God appointed a foreign nation to come in and to conquer his people and to take them away into exile. And so where we start here with David, where the king of God is on the throne, they're in the land that God has promised them and they have peace from their enemies. Now they find themselves where the line of kings has ended. The land is gone. And instead of having peace from their enemies, they are under the control and occupation of a foreign nation. And so you might imagine that God's people who remember the covenant he made with Abraham, they remember the covenant that God made with David, and they're asking themselves, God, what about your covenant? God, what about what you've promised us? Where's the line of kings? Where is the land? There's no hope for us now. Well, God sent his people a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. And one of the things that Jeremiah was told by God to tell the people of Israel, we find in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Here's what he says. God says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for who? For David. A righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely. And shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah comes to the people of God and tells them God wants his people to know I haven't yet fulfilled my promise to David. In other words, it wasn't about Solomon. It never was. In just these couple verses that Jeremiah shares with the people of Israel, what we see is that God will bring about a king on the throne. They will be back in the land that God has promised and that they will have rest from their enemies. The promise and the covenant has yet to be fulfilled when Jeremiah is speaking But what I'd like to tell you today is that God has fulfilled his covenant now where we stand in history today. I would like you to explore the idea with me that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of God's covenant with David. Let's just real quick, I want to run through the things that God promised to David would happen in this covenant. God told David that God will be to him a father and he will be to God a son Jesus was the Son of God. We see in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, concerning God's Son, who was a descendant of David, according to the flesh. Listen, we're we're entering into the Christmas season, and we're going to start a a series on Advent as we go into this. And it is no mistake that the beginning of the story of the coming of Jesus in Matthew's gospel begins in chapter 1, verse 1, by saying this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the Son of David. The son of Abraham. Jesus is that descendant. God told David that he would be disciplined by the rods of men, but that his love would not depart from him. We see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, Peter is talking about what Jesus endured on our behalf. He said, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You see, Jesus as God's son is the rightful king. God says that when he sins, he will discipline him with the rods of men. Guess what? Jesus never sinned. But the work of Jesus as he went to the cross was to take your sin upon himself. And so you see, Jesus was disciplined for sin, yes, but not his own. He was disciplined for yours. To where he received God's wrath and the punishment that was due that you deserved. And instead, now you can walk away completely guiltless and righteous. 
God said that David's descendant would build the temple. You might remember what Jesus said in John chapter 2, verse 19. When Jesus is speaking to some religious teachers, he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will what? I will raise it up. What was Jesus talking about there? He wasn't talking about a building. He was talking about his body. Jesus is the temple of God where the fullness of God is pleased to dwell. Jesus is the temple. God promised David that there would be a place for God's people. And Jesus, talking to his disciples, told them that he's going to prepare a place for them. In John 14, verse 3, he says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And God tells David that there would be rest from the enemies. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, here's, here's what we see there. It said that God has put all things in subjection under his feet. That's the enemies of God. All of the enemies have been conquered. They are under his boot. He has conquered them. And they are no more so that Jesus reigns in victory, in peace over the enemies of God. And God tells David that this will be an everlasting kingdom. Jesus is indeed alive and he is seated on the throne. In Acts chapter 2, verse 33, we read that Jesus is now exalted at the right hand of God, forever to reign, never to end. And so his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You see, what's so important and the reason that this is not simply the climax of the book of First and Second Samuel, but that this chapter is a huge deal for you and for me is because God was not just making a covenant with David here. God is making a covenant that is bestowing blessing upon you and upon me. It's not just a blessing upon you and on me and on David, but it is a blessing for the whole world so that ultimately what we see here is a fulfillment of God's covenant with Abraham when he said, through you, all the nations will be blessed. All the nations can be blessed because the death and sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't just for David. It's not just for you and me. It is for the whole world. God has fulfilled his covenant with David. God has done this for you. He's done it for me. And just in case, just in case, maybe you came here today defining your relationship with God by what you do for him. I just want to take a minute to remind you what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. What I read earlier from Jeremiah, it said that his name, this king's name will be the Lord is our righteousness. Understand this, is that if your posture towards God is one of guilt, if you approach God as one who is guilty over your sin. Here's the reason why. The reason that you approach God with guilt is because you have this innate sense and understanding that you lack something. It's that you lack righteousness. It's that you lack what you need to be fully absolved and approved in the eyes of God. That when you do come to him, when you would approach God, you you understand that the standard that God requires of you is left unmet and that you stand condemned as unrighteous and unjust. And that is why it is such good news that this king that God has promised to us has a name, that he is our righteousness. He is what we need. I'd like to take you to a passage in the New Testament that explained this so clearly and so beautifully. And that's Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. This is amazing news for us. It says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. What these two verses say is this, a very basic message. Righteousness with God is not met through the law. In other words, what you do. Righteousness with God is based on what he has done for you. It is realized through faith 
in Jesus Christ, and it is applied to all who believe in him. Jesus is the righteous one that came to this earth and completely fulfilled the law of God. He never sinned, yet, as I said, he went to the cross taking your guilt upon himself so that you might take his righteousness upon yourself. He took your place and rose from the grave after three days of being dead so that you no longer have to be dead in your sins, but you can have new life in Christ. And I hope that what you are reminded of today is that God's grace towards you in sending his son Jesus to die for you can absolve you of your guilt as you stand before him so that you do not have to come here in a posture of guilt, but that you can come here in a posture of gratitude for what God has done for you. And it's my prayer today that if, if you recognize and that if you see that you have been coming to God and that you've been defining your relationship with God based on what you do for him, my prayer is that you can now see that that doesn't have to be so. In fact, God has made a way so that the way your relationship with him can be defined is by what he has done for you and that that can change your guilt to gratitude. If that's a change that you see you need to make today, if you see that, that, yeah, that's how I've been approaching God, and yes, I do feel guilty, but I want the sacrifice of Christ to cover my sins so that I don't have to approach God as one guilty anymore, but so that as David did, I can praise God with gratitude and thanksgiving and a miraculous understanding of what he has done for me. I want to invite you to respond to that today. I want to give you an opportunity to communicate that that is something that you need to do, that you do need to put your faith in Christ. Romans chapter 3 verse 22 says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. That, that righteousness can be credited to you by faith if you but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if that is a decision, if that is something that you need to do today, here's a very simple way that you can respond. The pew that's right in front of you on the back, there are little cards that have written on them, connect. You can just take one of those out. You can fill out your information. And all you need to do is on your way out, at, at each exit, there's a little box with that same face of the card. All you need to do is drop it in there. Just designate on that card somewhere that you need to talk to somebody about what it means for you to put your faith in Christ. That's all you need to do. And at some point this week, myself or one of our other pastors will contact you and we will talk to you about that. But my prayer is that God would lead you to do that today. If you've been approaching him as one guilty, that at the end of the service, you would instead be able to sing to him as one that is profoundly grateful for what he's done for you. If you would join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that today we would leave as those that have been made right by our King, who is our righteousness. Father, I pray that we would be able to do nothing except of seeing of the great things that you have done. That we, we, that we would be able to do nothing except recognize that all we are able to do is sit back to receive the grace that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. You, you have no real reason for choosing us, Lord. And so we, we can't do anything but say, who am I that you would do this for me? Father, I pray that that our people here, that Monroe Missionary Baptist Church, that the things that we do, the way that we live would not be done out of a sense of duty towards you to be made right in your eyes, but Lord, that it would be done as an act of worship of what you have done. Father, I pray that we would be a transformed people because of the work of your Son, Christ. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do, but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? 
we do Do you wish that you could see it all made new? We do And is all creation groaning? It is Is a new creation coming? It is Is the glory of the Lord to be The light within our midst? It is Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? It is Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? He is. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And is Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves? He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave from every people and tribe. Every nation and tongue, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he worthy of this? He is. Is he worthy? Is he worthy? seen in this series as we've been going through First and Second Samuel is that Saul was a really bad king, but David was just as unworthy of a king for what our real need is. But there is a king who is worthy, and there is a king who was able to do all that we ever needed our king to do, and the good news is he is worthy to take the scroll. The good news is that he is the one that's on the throne right now, and the good news is that if you put your faith in him, his grace can change your guilt into gratitude for what he's done for you. Amen. Let me pray for us, and then I'll dismiss you by sections today. Heavenly Father, we do come to you grateful for what you have done for us, Lord. Who are we 
that you would do it for us. And what more can we say to you, Lord, except thank you? And what more can we praise you with other than saying who you are and what you have done for us, just shouting it back to you, Lord? And so I pray that today we would be able to reflect on that and to do that, Lord. I pray that when we talk to each other, we would be able to talk about who you are and how great you are and the great work that you've done in each and every one of our lives so that our, even our conversation can be an act of worship towards you, Lord. Father, thank you for who you are and what you've done. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll uh, allow the two in sections. You can go ahead and be dismissed. sections. Next two sections, you all can go. Thank you. 